Good day and welcome to the Heikel Limited Q4FY22 earnings conference call. This conference call may contain forward-looking statements about the company which are based on the beliefs, opinions and expectations of the company as on date of this call. These statements are not guarantees of future performance and involve risk and uncertainties that are difficult to predict. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Anish Swadi, Business Transformation. Thank you and over to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you. And thank you very much for joining us today for our Q4 2022 FY earnings call. I am Anish Swadi, Senior President of Business Transformation and Head of the Management Committee. With me, I have Mr. Kuldeep Jain, our Chief Financial Officer, Mr. Manoj Merotra, our President, Pharmaceuticals Business, Mr. Vimal Kushret, our President, Crop Protection Business, and Strategic Growth Advisors, our Investor Relations Advisors. We hope you and your family members are safe and healthy. I am pleased to interact with all of you on our Q4 FY22 earnings call. I hope you have gone through our earnings release presentation and financial results for the quarter. You can find these on the stock exchanges and on our website too. I would like to start this call with an update on the unfortunate incident which occurred at Sachin GIDC Surat on 6th January 2022. Allegations were made that the tanker involved was carrying a byproduct which allegedly came from Heikel's Taloja factory. We would like to reiterate the fact that the tanker reported as allegedly disposing chemicals into the stream was not the same tanker that left the company's premises in Taloja. The company has provided all documentary evidence to this effect. All relevant employees of Heikel have voluntarily cooperated in the ongoing investigation. Since then, there has been a judicial recognition of the non-existent role of Heikel and its employees in the entire incident, as elucidated by the Honorable Gujarat High Court in its order. As on date, none of the Heikel employees are in judicial custody and all have resumed work. This matter is still sub and as things stand, Heikel is in a very strong legal position. As a result of the Sachin GIDC incident, the MPCB had also given us a closure notice to the Taloja factory. We have provided all the relevant documents to MPCB and we are taking appropriate measures under the course of law to remedy the situation swiftly. We are confident of resolving the issue on the closure notice at the earliest, having filed a writ petition to that effect, which will be heard in the coming week once the regular bench convenes. Upon reopening the plant, we will be begin executing the pender or pending order book, which has been built up over the course of this quarter, despite these testing times, and only further illustrates the fact that our order book is strong. However, owing to the nature of the business, we'll have to gradually ramp up the scale of operations, which could have some short-term impact on our crop protection business. We have been transparent about the matter and have actively communicated with all our internal and external stakeholders, including customers. We appreciate the fact that they have continued to demonstrate high level of confidence in our company. In order to ensure such an unfortunate incident does not repeat in the future, we are taking stringent and proactive steps towards further strengthening our compliance policies and standard operating procedures. We have already onboarded a reputed audit firm, Mahajan and Ibera, for our internal audit. We have also partnered with a reputed ESG firm and initiated focused third-party audits for our entire plant network to identify and fill in gaps for further areas of improvement. We are also working closely with our customers to ensure a best-in-class operating model. Now I'd like to just give you an overview of our FY22 performance. From a market perspective, we all know the latter half of FY22 has been extremely challenging for the life sciences industry, especially due to the uncertainty arising from Ukraine-Russia war, geopolitical tensions, and the re-emergence of COVID cases in China. This has led to significant headwinds in the availability and pricing of key raw materials and solvents. Also, the 
huge rise in crude oil prices have significantly impacted freight as well as logistics costs. Despite multiple challenges and disruptions, ICL has been able to maintain to a large extent supply continuity and fulfilled a large majority of its customer commitments. The agility shown by Heikel team in such a challenging scenario has been very positive. From a financial update perspective, for the year ended FY22, Heikel has achieved a consolidated total revenue of 1,943 cores for the year, witnessing a total growth of 13% over the previous year. Profit before tax was 341 crores, a growth of 5%. Our EBITDA margin for the year came in at 17.6%. Heikel was witnessing robust growth from Q1 to Q3 of FY22 with 21% growth for the nine months FY21 versus FY22 with a 19.6% EBITDA margin versus 18% in the corresponding year prior to that. This was on the back of industry tailwinds with supply chain management and strong business growth across both our segments. However, the global shutdown slowdown in the generics business due to channel inventory and lower demand offtake led to muted growth in the last quarter. Also, a lag in passing on increased prices, supply chain disruption, and significant rise in input costs affected our business further. Our balance sheet and return ratios. In addition to growing the top line and bottom line, we have also been making focused efforts to strengthen our balance sheet and to the return ratios of the company. As a result, our debt to equity ratio now stands at 0.59 times as compared to 0.61 times at the end of the previous financial year and 0.73 times in the year before that. We have also negotiated with our bankers to bring down our average borrowing costs from 6.99% in March 2021 to a blended rate of 6.155% in March 2022. Our return on equity has also improved to 16.2% in FY22 from 15.2% in FY21 and 10.7% in the year preceding that. These numbers indicate a healthy condition of our business considering the nature of operations along with the ongoing and planned capacity expansions. On the dividend, the company has declared a final dividend of 20% of 40 paise and the total dividend for FY22 is 80% of 1 rupee 60 paise. Now I'd like to hand over to our president pharmaceuticals, Mr. Manoj Merotra, to take us through the performance of the pharmaceutical division. Thank you, Anish, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on the financial side, the pharma business has experienced a muted revenue growth, 6.6% with 1,130 crore total revenue in FY22 versus 1,060 crore in FY21. The EBIT of the division was at rupees 151 crore at 13.4% margin in FY22. This muted trend was primarily due to, one, overstocking with customers, two, pass-through underway, three, rise in input costs of raw materials, solvents, utility, and freight costs. On price pass-through, we are in discussion with customers, the impact of which we will see in the upcoming fiscal year. Uh, as we all know, we have two verticals within the pharma business, API and CDMO. On the API business, over the year, we have added several new customers and strengthened presence in new geographies like Latin America and Japan. Our new product launches in anti-diabetic have been witnessing increased traction from customers. We have 10 plus products in development pipeline and are planning to launch four to five products in FY23. The CDMO side, our CDMO business has witnessed increased traction with 20% increase in overall inquiries with increase in win rate as well. We have converted two opportunities this year, two KSMs for new drugs with Global Innovator and one intermediate opportunity with another innovator. Several customers have done plant visits in FY22. Our future pipeline for CDMO business remains robust with working going on in multiple upcoming opportunities. On the animal health side, our animal health business continues to witness growth on back of existing relationship with majority of key AH companies. We have also commenced process development work for several active ingredients which are part of the multi-year animal health project with the Global Innovator. We plan to finish the commissioning of plant by FY23 
and start revenue accrual from FY24. While our business pipeline continues to be strong, we have also undertaken multiple initiatives to improve our margins, to ensure right raw material availability and pricing of our PRMs. We are working on one strategic vendor relationship with long-term contracts, two de-risking supply chain from China, and three backward integration in it. In addition to this, we are working on multiple manufacturing excellence or cost improvement prop programs to improve yield and solvent recovery for our key products. With all these initiatives, we foresee future pressures to persist in FY23. Q1 will face more pressure, followed by gradual uptake starting in quarter two FY23. With that, I invite uh, our president of uh, crop production business, Vimal Kulchesh. Thank you, Manoj. Good afternoon, all participants in the earning call. The crop business has recorded revenue growth of 23% year on year with 813 crore total revenue in FY22 versus 661 crore in FY21. The habit of division was at 116 crore at 14.3 margin in FY22. The revenue growth was mainly achieved on the back of higher demand from our leading CDMO customers new contracts with key U.S. and Japanese customers, sale of our own products slowed down due to raw material availability issues. In crop business, we have two business verticals. In own products, demand from our existing product remains intact from our key customers. We are also planning to complete the plant commissioning of our new fungicide by uh, end of uh, uh, by end of uh, uh, third quarter of current uh, current uh, calendar year and start revenue accrual by end of FY23. We are planning to launch one more fungicide with a combined potential of 400 to 500 crore. We'll also continue to explore new product opportunities in the business and five to six products are under development as well. In CDMO business, our CDMO business continue to receive inquiries from all new customers. Several new customers have done planned visits in FY22. We are increasing efforts to build an strengthen relationship with our U.S. and Japanese customers. To ensure stable availability and pricing of key raw materials, we are working on developing a strategic vendor relationship with long-term contracts, and de-risking supply chain from China. We are also planning to initiate manufacturing excellence programs to lower production costs and improve margins. Now I hand over to uh, Anish for future outlook. Great, thank you Vimal and Manoj. Um, since our business heads have now talked about their respective businesses, I would like to take you through some of our other key priorities we are working on as part of Project Pinnacle. As you already know, we are undergoing a transformation of our business from good to great while continuing to drive profitable growth. We have also onboarded a global consultant to help us identify the right strategic direction for choosing the suitable products, partners, technologies for the future while bolstering our R&D and manufacturing capabilities. Some of the key focus areas for this financial year will be compliance. As I have mentioned earlier in my address as well, we are taking stringent steps towards strengthening our compliance policies, de-risking, separating the operating model of both our businesses, stricter vendor due diligences and revamp of vendor contracts, third-party audits of all our plants, and process improvements to enhance checks and balances. We are making every effort to, and endeavor to ensure the company is not involved in any such incident ever again. Cost improvements. We are taking targeted actions to ensure our bottom line improvement by price pass through on long-term contracts, manufacturing excellence programs, uh, which is cost improvement programs for priority products to improve yield and solvent recoveries, strategic vendor relationships for key raw materials, backward integration, and a shift to renewable energy and biomass. Customers, customer centricity remains key for Heichel. We will continue to fulfill our commitments and deliver best in class quality products our continued focus will be to increase share with existing customers while adding new customers and strengthening presence in newer geographies such as Latin America and Japan. 
Capacity utilization and expansion, we are working on improving our asset utilization with a clear focus on reduction in cycle time and change over times. We will continue to selectively invest in growth opportunities for the businesses to ensure that we are investing in right opportunities, offering long-term returns to the business. In terms of outlook for next year, we expect FY23 to be a year of necessary slowdown and consolidation to prepare us for future accelerated growth. We expect market headwinds to continue, but we are confident that the strong measures taken will help us navigate these turbulent situations. Pressure in Q1 will remain high, higher than that of Q4, but we are confident of improving quarter on quarter starting Q2. The growth trajectory along with new opportunities, strong customer relationships and new technologies will catalyze the future of our business towards our bold aspirations. Finally, we are a company that has been in business for over 34 years. We have faced multiple headwinds and been through several ups and downs in our journey. However, we have always navigated through these tough times without compromising on our core values and ethics. Our business has been and continues to be built on long-term relationships. The past six months has been challenging. However, I am confident that we will come out, as we come out of this, we will be a more nimble, flexible, and resilient company. We are eternally grateful to all our colleagues who have risen to the occasion on, and all our stakeholders who have supported us during these difficult times. While the short to medium term outlook is cloudy, the longer term growth and profitability story is very much intact. Thank you all for your time and support. With this, we will now open the floor to questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. Reminder to the participants, anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one at this time. The first question is from the line of Rahul Jain from Credence Wealth. Please go ahead. Hello. Yes, sir. Hello. Your line isn't off. Please already? go ahead. Yes. So just to understand, so last call, uh, we remember the commentary with regards to the growth and demand outlook was quite, quite buoyant. At the same time, the commentary with regards to input cost was bearish, and you had mentioned it takes some time to pass on the cost to the consumers. So just to understand on the growth part and the demand side and the sales revenue part, what has changed uh, in last, say, two, three months, whereby our commentary has changed from a strong demand outlook, a buoyant out demand outlook, to something where you seem to be more cautious or uh, talking about the next year being a very challenging year. Sure. I would, what I would do is I'll hand this over to Vimal for the crop protection, and then Manoj can talk about the pharma division. Yeah. So uh, demand is strong. We are getting customer inquiries, and we are confident that we would continue to get inquiries in our CDMO space and own products also. The challenge has been in quarter four of supply chain. So there were a lot of supply chain disruption, you know, after this uh, Russia and Ukraine war. Crude has gone up sharply. Energy has almost become double. Prices were, raw material prices has increased almost 40 to 60 percent. Solvent prices have increased. So that is what has created the issue. One is raw material availability and second on, on the pricing issues, which has put uh, pressure on the margin. We expect a lag in passing uh, this uh, price, passing the cost impact in the price, and we are confident that from Q2 we'll be able to pass on this in the prices. Over to Manoj for Pharma. Yeah, so I'll uh, address this question in two parts. Number one is on the demand side. So demand, uh, since we have two distinct segments, on the CDMO side, we are seeing increasing demand with more number of inquiries coming, more number of customers willing to work with Heikel. 
but as we know that uh, cinema side the demand takes some time to ramp up but we are seeing very very positive signals from our customers on the demand side on cdm on the api side since our raw material uh, costs have uh, gone up and we have been in discussions with various customers for increase in uh, selling prices and that actually subdued the demand uh, in the short term because everybody wants to kind of uh, and go back or uh, liquidate the inventories first so there definitely is a short term impact and uh, since we are in b2b business it takes some time for uh, customers to take suitable decisions as well and we would also not like to really sell at uh, very low prices and build up inventory at customers end so it's better to be a little slow and steady and, uh, and make sure that the past cost is passed on over a period of time but that usually it takes around two two to three quarters i will say and we don't want to we want to retain all our existing customers because in the long run it is the same customers who will give us the margin on the cdmo side although we have contracts for pass through costs but they always have a lag effect because we can't uh, do month by month uh, pass through cost it is always either three month or six month uh, a window where the customers uh, discuss is mostly 6 months and uh, 6 months and it takes some time for us uh, to pass through also the uh, energy costs have been uh, just uh, shooting to the roof and not showing any respite whether it is fuel whether it is coal whether it is biomass briquettes and uh, that is causing a lot of pressure so overall the cost side there is pressure uh, it will take uh, i'll say q3 onwards q2 onwards you will definitely see better uh, margins from the pharma business but long term demand uh, remains good all our products and relationship with customers stand steady we will continue to add new customers on cdmo side as well as on the generic api side so just to further this question ki our margins on the pharma side were already uh, you know below the averages for last three quarters and this quarter we have had probably the worst margins on the pharma side and both agro side so do we expect say, this to continue say for another quarter and quarter to onwards will we see a sharp improvement or a gradual improvement and when do we expect to get back to our normal margin right so uh, i'll take the, the the former question manoj you can take the, the the question but i'll just answer the on the overall perspective of the company I think it's very difficult for us to give guidance in terms of margin at this period of time because things are very uncertain and things are very fluid. Um, I think Q1 overall for the company, as we look at it, will certainly be more subdued than Q4. But as Manoj and Vimal have both mentioned, on Q2 onwards, you'll start seeing an improvement going forward. So it'll be a stepwise approach. Q1 will probably bottom out, and then you'll have an improvement in Q2, and then you'll see an increase in Q3 and Q4 going forward. I so see when you'll see us get back to it we are hopeful that you know next financial year you'll see us getting back to it but there are a lot of external circumstances that are beyond our control and we do expect and we are hopeful that they will solve themselves in a short amount of period so that's why it's a little we are a little cautious in terms of giving guidance at this period of time thanks I agree with Anish uh, that uh, the Q1 will uh, see a bottoming, bottoming out of the margin. Q2 onwards, uh, uh, the uptick will start. Now, with the, how long will it take to reach the previous margins uh, is a little dis- uh, difficult to forecast at this stage because we all know that uh, supply chains across the world are uh, very much disrupted, and on top of it, this uh, energy costs uh, have really put a pressure on our uh, costs. Sure. And secondly, so on the uh, growth part, uh, as far as our top line is concerned, are we more confident on the top line compared to the margin? Given also, Anish, that uh, we have done, or as per the results, the capitalization is roughly around 170, 180 crores uh, in terms of the fixed assets addition. Uh, but at the same time. Uh, in terms of the cash flow amount being spent we have almost spent uh, roughly around 150 crores each in the two years fy20 fy21 and further about 270 crores in fy22 
So just to understand, when do we see the benefits of CapEx kicking in, and thereby the top line growth being much better? Right. So again, uh, reiterating the point of uh, guidance, uh, you know, at this point in time, it's a little challenging to for us to give you both revenue guidance and uh, margin guidance. But certainly, the assets that we put on ground, all the capex that we have, we are finishing off the capex. Whatever spending, we're finishing off because they're mostly backed by contracts and or uh, products that we have in the pipeline. But given the current situation that we have with the raw material and input costs, it's very challenging to say that you know, when we're going to start the operations of those plants, you know, for production. But we are hopeful, as both the business heads have indicated, that on Q2 onwards, at the end of Q2 onwards, we'll see a resurrection in terms of the business, and you'll start to see that growth and profitability come through. So, and just the last thing, the CapEx capitalization. So, uh, if you could, uh, what amount has been, uh, what amount of CapEx do we expect in the current year, and what amount of capitalization do we expect in the current year to be done on the CapEx side? Yeah, sure. I'll take Yadish this question. See, we are expecting 252 to 275 crore cash flow for this year. And the capitalization will be close to 400 crore in the current financial year. Okay, so that means uh, if I just take two years, FY22 and FY23, the total capitalization will be roughly about uh, 565, 80 crores. Is that correct? 600 crore almost. And then in terms of the asset turn, how do we look at this CAPEX asset turn for FY24 and 25? Yeah, typically, as we mentioned earlier, in case of pharma business, it takes typically 18 months to 24 months to put it to commercialization. And in case of the crop protection, it takes typically six to nine months after completion of the project. Sure. Sorry, just pardon me for this last one. Uh, so what is the CAPEX schedule in terms of the commercials being started in this year? That's the last yeah. one. Yeah, so for the crop CAPEX, we expect to start, expect to commission in Q3 of 23, and we expect to accrual of revenue from Q4 of, or end of the year of FY23. Sure, sure. Thank you so much. Uh, wish you all the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ankit Gupta from Bamboo Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, um, thanks for the opportunity. So, uh, you know, taking forward this question on CAPEX, you know, 600 crore, we will be capitalizing uh, over the FY23. So, uh, uh, one thing I wanted to understand, Anish, you know, let's forget about FY23. FY23, we do understand the kind of challenges we are facing. But let's say over FY25, with 600 uh, crore CAPEX being in, uh, being coming in the uh, in streamline and given, you know, let's say one, one and a half years of streamlining, do we think that, you know, this 600 crore uh, CAPEX can give us additional 1,000 crore kind of revenue and we reach a top line of, say, around 3,000 crore by FY25? I'm not even talking about FY23, but I'm talking about FY25. Yeah, so uh, I'm a very valid question. I mean, I think by 24, 25, we definitely expect, you know, uh, us to be operating somewhere near close to peak levels. As we've indicated in the past, peak levels are about 1.5 times, right? You know, so to answer your question, you know, whatever we have coming on stream now, we expect to deliver revenues worth 1.5 times of what we have to be in the ground, right? To be at least 3,000 crore by FI 25. I'm sorry, you were inaudible at the time. Can you please repeat that? Yeah, so, so we can at least touch uh, you know, uh, 3,000 crore revenue by FI 25. Yeah, that should be possible. So, and also, um, you know, uh, uh, the kind of uh, commentaries you guys have given earlier, you know, uh, of course, we do understand that uh, first half of next year will be challenging. But on the margin side, let's say when you touch uh, 3,000 crore revenue, what kind of margin improvement do we see in our base margin of around 19-20% that we have been reporting or uh, you know the past year or two? From there, uh, what kind of margins can we see in FY25 when we hit peak revenue? And hopefully, all these headwinds that we are facing currently are also behind us. 
So look, uh, so, when we look at the future margins of the business, I mean, look, up to the nine months ended this finan- or last financial year, we were at a very, very healthy run rate, right? As you yeah. could see from 19%. So we were actually a little ahead of what our targets were. And had we continued or had we had not external challenges like the current environment, we would have certainly delivered on our growth and exceeded it. I think if we look at the longer term vision, we certainly see about 20% margins. Uh, from where we are and renew our consolidated growth as we've indicated in the past. The current situation, given where we are with the external challenges that we have, it's very difficult to tell. But the long-term picture, the long-term horizon for both businesses are very much intact. We're very positive about it, which is why we're still investing in it. And most of the investments are going back on the basis of our customer commitments. Sure. Because earlier, you know, you have always guided over the past year or two that we will see at least one, one and a half percent kind of margin improvement uh, to as compared to a base margin to 19, 20 percent over the next few years. So let's forget about FY23. But let's say from FY24 onwards, can we come? Can we, you know, start seeing that improvement from our base levels of 19, 20 percent in FY24 and 25 every year? Yes, we should. We should. And I had always indicated 50 to 100 basis points on an annual basis, yeah. but yes, we should. And yeah. that's what we're working towards. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, and, uh, you know, on the CAPEX side, uh, given the kind of segments that we are facing currently, uh, what are our CAPEX plans for FY23 and 24? Right now, for FY24, we haven't uh, gotten any CAPEX because it all depends on where we are today. But as uh, Kuldeep, our CFO, had mentioned, is that we're completing all the CAPEX that we had uh, backed by the customer contracts that we had initiated last year on the crop side for uh, the crop division. And for the pharma division, we have the animal health CAPEX that we're undertaking this year and a slight expansion in R&D based on the inquiries or the number of inquiries we've had and that we need to cater to. So we have to invest in that. So we expect that, um, you know, it's only CapEx that we need to do. Obviously, it's focusing on what's absolutely necessary at that time and what's backed by customer commitments. Um, What's good to have is something that we're, at this point in time, deferring probably till the second half of this financial year. How much will that amount be for FI23? How much CapEx is still left, uh, you know, where we have uh, commitment from customers or uh, commitment from customers? Uh, yeah, so about 250 to 270 crores, as as uh, Kuldeep our CFO had mentioned. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. And you know, last question on the pharma side. You know, FY19 we ended pharma with revenues of around you know 940 crores, 939 or 940 crores. And this year we are ending with 1130 crores. So it's a single digit kind of revenue growth that we have seen over the past three years in pharma. So if you can highlight about, you know, uh, what kind of challenges we have we faced on the pharma side, despite most of the API companies running in a moolah uh, in past year or two. So what has uh, what has been the reason of such slow growth in pharma uh, side? And, you know, leave apart FY23, how much growth do we see in pharma segment during FY24 and 25? Uh, Go ahead. Anish, yeah. So on the farmer side, if you see, typically the revenue growth uh, has been uh, 10 to 12 percent. If you see uh, uh, overall CAGR of uh, five years, it will be more in the range of 13, 14 percent. And uh, yes, in between we had a little slowdown in one year, and that's why uh, maybe this two-year period is dropping. But uh, over an extended five-year period, we have uh, close to 13, 14 percent. Uh, what we are looking at for the future is uh, adding uh, more new products on the API side. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are uh, launching several new products on the anti-diabetic uh, segment. And uh, number two is uh, we are looking at uh, building uh, new relationships on the CDMO side, where we offer our development and manufacturing services. And the third vertical is the animal health business, which we believe uh, uh, has got very good potential. Uh, there are a limited number of players out here, and uh, we believe Heikel is in a very good uh, cost position and strategic position to ensure that we get capture more of the animal health market. So we will be in all the three segments, and I think uh, the growth will always be in uh, that range, I'll say close to 12 to 15% going forward. So from FY24 onwards also, like we expect the pharma, uh, to, pharma segment to grow at 12 to 15%. 
Yes, that's uh, that's a bad. Yeah. By 23, we'll have to wait and watch as we explain uh, on the various issues. But as for going future, definitely we'll go back to our uh, growing ways with these uh, three initiatives I mentioned on APIs, on CDMO business, and animal health business. We are very bullish on CDMO and animal health because uh, it is upper alley. We have done uh, several such uh, projects. Uh, it is, uh, and customers like to work with us uh, in those segments. And we have made a success of it in the past, and we'll do more so in future in these two segments. So, uh, last question on the Blipin side. You know, we have been very hopeful that, you know, Blipin, uh, like two, three years back, uh, we were very confident that Blipin as a segment on the pharma side will scale up. We'll see some, you know, uh, at least few molecules coming out of this lifting segment, which can contribute 50 to 100 crore of additional revenue per molecule. So if you can talk about how have this uh, segment or lifting as a segment scaled up for us and how much is it contributing to our revenues currently? Well, the gliptins are just, uh, you know, anti-diabetic side, there are two segments. One are gliptins and gliflozins. Uh, they are both coming out of patent now, actually. Like, say, something like Citagliptin, FY24 will be the real uh, uh, year where we will see significant commercial sales. As of now, we have provided development quantities and seeding quantities to various customers, and they can launch only once the patent expires in various markets, which we will start seeing good commercial sales in FY24 onwards on, on the full anti-diabetic uh, segment. Sure. Thank you, and wish you all Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Dhwanil Desai from Total Capital. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, so, Anish, the first question is, I think, if we go back to our earlier calls, I think we were aspiring to grow anywhere between 15 to 20 percent uh, year on year. And barring FY23, if we I, I understand that that commentary continues, uh, and if only pharma segment grows at 12 to 15 percent, crop protection has to grow at much faster rate, right? So, how do we how do we correlate these two things together? So, I think you know um, basically based on what the current situation is, we're being a little more conservative, but we certainly feel that both divisions can grow at 15 percent, right? Um, given the current situation. As we said, it's very little, very difficult for us to give guidance post FY23. But if you look at the comparison between the crop business and the pharma business, you know, crop can scale up much faster than that of pharma because of the regulations and because of the validation and the time taken to actually get to commercial. You know, being originating as a crop company 32 or 34 years ago, we know this business inside out. We see the massive demand in terms of both our product pipeline and the commercial that we have currently in in process. We certainly see crop being more of a hockey stick approach, while pharma taking its time because of all the regulations, the different markets that we're entering. Both businesses will continue to grow at 15%, and that's how we're confident of how. When is a bit of a challenge to say right now, given where we are today with the external forces that we have. Okay. Okay. Uh, second question, Anik, slightly direct question, but uh, I mean, the change in commentary on demand side, I understand RM pressure and everything is there for everybody. Uh, but in span of this three months, uh, you know, the change in comments is quite, quite significant. So is it because have we lost any significant customer uh, or contract, uh, you know, which is leading us to kind of taper down uh, our growth aspiration for FI23? So we've lost not a single customer, neither have we lost a single contract. Our customers have stood by us during this difficult period of time, and they are still with us. In fact, we are in discussions with our existing customers on how to increase volumes as we go forward. So our customers are very much with us. The demand has come off, like in the pharma business, as Manoj has alluded to, the demand on the generic side has come off because there's been a lot of inventory, uh, uh, there's been a lot of pipeline in the inventory. On the CDMO side, I definitely see the demand to be buoyant, and it's all about us executing the demand. The challenge there has been is that the input costs have gone significantly high. 
And for us to be in business, we need to make money as well. So we're working with our customers, taking into account that these are long-term relationships, that we will work with our customers to ensure that it's a win-win situation for both of us. But we have not lost a single customer and or a single contract. Okay, that's very helpful. Uh, so, uh, so again, coming back to the margin side of it, I think we have been guiding, as you said, 50 to 100 bits margin improvement every year as the growth comes back. Uh, now, we, have, we are undertaking this transformation program uh, uh, quite a big initiative that we've been talking about. So, uh, so this 50 to 100 bits was before even the transformation program that you had undertaken, right? So, I mean, is there any positive rub off impact of that which can kind of, you know, improve the potential of margin improvement going forward? So we certainly see, I mean, a lot of the programs that we've taken, actually, we would have been worse off had we not undertaken the programs and had our uh, global partner not been with us because a lot of those initiatives had started late last financial year. So if we were to compare, and we do compare this internally, had we continued the way we were in terms of our programs versus what are the value add has been from our external partners, it's significant, right? It's significant improvement. So the raw material costs, the input costs have been so substantially higher than what we had predicted, but some of those cost improvement programs that we've undertaken has helped to actually save us money. Otherwise, the impact would have been even worse. Uh, I think going forward, you know, getting on board cost improvement programs also looks at strategic uh, supply chain, right? So we've also developed strategic suppliers to de-risk uh, ourselves from the Chinese supply chain. Um, so that takes time, right? So we have various programs which will eventually come on stream, I would estimate probably in the next half of this financial year, which will actually lead to supply chain de-risking and eventually a uh, increase in terms of margin. Okay. Okay. And last question. Uh, so last question is uh, basically, uh, you know, with with respect to uh, you know our. Uh, Hello? Line for the current participant has got disconnected. We'll move on to the next question from the line of Shravan from Premier Capital. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. So I needed a little more uh, color on our animal health contract. It's been uh, like a year since we got that contract. So any any uh, color you can give on the kind of capex we are incurring specifically for that uh, large uh, client that we are working with and also the kind of potential we see revenue potential over next three years probably Yeah, so uh, Shavan, um, basically as we had indicated in the past calls as well uh, Since this is a very confidential contract. We're not disclosing the amount of investment that we're putting in um, however you know, in this case, our customer is contributing to 50% of the capital expenditure that we are putting into the plant, which shows their long-term commitment. It is a 10-year contract. It is multiple products in the contract itself, so it's a diversified contract. Um, the asset turnover ratios of the revenue is going to be more or, line in, more or less in line of what we are doing today, which is one and a half times what the asset that we're putting in. It is a substantial asset that we are building. And this is just the first phase of the products that we have in the pipeline. So there's, you know, this is wave one and wave two. There's also wave three and wave four that will potentially come down the line. The animal health business, as Manoj alluded to, is a very strong potential for us. We are seeing a lot of traction in there, not only from this customer, but also from other customers that are now looking at rationalizing their supply chains and their product portfolios. So we definitely do expect good things for the animal health business in the years to come. Right, right. And like uh, on previous calls when we spoke about this animal uh, contract and the kind of capex that we're doing, we we clearly said that the kind of uh, the capex that we're doing is uh, typically for products that have better uh, gross margins than currently that we have. So all those things hold, like um, the kind of the products that would come on stream later part of this year and FY24, the margin profile of those products would be significantly better. Yeah, I would say they're incrementally better than what we have right now. Obviously, it takes time to go to full, 
uh, potential, but we do estimate that the products to be about 45% contribution margins on those uh, animal health products. Right, right. And uh, like, uh, just just two more questions. One is like, uh, one is uh, we we are seeing this uh, somber uh, uh, demand uh, environment, but we've mentioned in our press release that H2 we see the animal health, uh, the the crop protection capex coming on stream. So that would add to incremental revenues in H2. We would see that only in the latter part of Q3 or Q4, right? Yeah, since the plant comes on stream towards the end of quarter three. When you fire up the plant, you validate the product, and then you start selling, you'll really see some part of revenue coming in this financial year to the end of quarter four. Right, right. And uh, like I, just, this is a, this is a uh, like a, uh, my own uh, thing that I wanted to share with you that if you see year on year, our expenses in such a challenging environment, our expenses have actually gone up. So our employee expenses are up thirty percent, while our other expenses are up ten, twelve percent. So in this challenging environment, shouldn't we following? Should we be following a much more stringent uh, uh, control on our expenses? Uh, as our margins are down, what 800, 900 basis points, why, why? So shouldn't we be a little more aggressive on cost controls? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, firstly, our margins are down 800, 900 basis points only when you compare Q4. But for the first nine months of the year, the margins were up, and the growth was there. But there is something definitely that we have been looking at very well, very closely. Um, we have looked at every cost that we have. We have stripped out whatever is not necessary. Again, we had invested for future growth. When you have a plant that's coming on stream, you need to hire because the hiring process itself takes anywhere between four to six months to get people on board or good people on board. And these are complex multi-purpose operational plants that we have. We've also hired for future growth. So we are putting the handbrake on a lot of costs. We are rationalizing costs. But the key here is while we do that, the focus is on improving margins and growing our business because you can only cut costs so much. But to your point, it's absolutely at the forefront of uh, our current uh, financial uh, governance that we have right now. Right. Got it. Got it. And just one last question. So if I just uh, uh, look at the crop protection business, so pharma business till Q3 also we were facing a lot of pressures, Q2 and Q3. But the sequential drop that we see in the crop protection business, can you just highlight a little more whether like the lockdown in China, did that lead to us not being able to meet some demand because of the supply chain issues or like uh, because of the lockdown, could we source some of the materials or did they went up so high? Because the sequential fall in crop protection margins is quite a lot. Like pharma is down, but we were facing those issues in Q3 also. Just if you could highlight a little more on crop protection uh, business, because when we spoke last on 10th February or when we had the last call, at that time, the, uh, the, the scenario of the crop protection business wasn't that bad. So I understand the war and everything and that has taken place post that only. But I really, uh, like if you could just highlight a little more on what actually transpired in the crop protection business for such a sharp sequential decline. Yeah, Anish, I'll take this call. So as I mentioned to you in my speech that there has been supply chain disruption which we faced and those disruptions are, one is that availability of raw materials and other is the price. The way there was sharp increase in crude prices, energy also has almost become double. And there were issue of, uh, I mean, uh, passing the cost to the price and the availability of raw metal. And that has uh, impacted between Q3 and Okay, perfect. Thank you so much and all the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Piyush Jain from Hansraj Vendra Capital. Please go ahead. Well, thanks for the opportunity. So my question is on the pharmaceutical segment. Mr. Jain, sorry it to interrupt you. The audio is not clear from your line. Please use the handset mode. Is it better now? Yes, sir. Uh, so my question is on the pharmaceutical segment. As we are talking about a good growth coming in for the next couple of years, can you throw some light if we look at our DMS filings for the last three years, it's been one API for at least for FI 2021 20, and 22. 
so can you just throw some light how the given pipeline is evolving uh, on the development side and where do we see the most of the growth would be coming from the existing approved projects products or it would be some new development projects which you would be working on I mean, do you mind repeating the question? Uh, I think your audio was not uh, very clear towards the beginning. So my question is on the product pipeline on the pharmaceutical segment. So if we look at our DMF filing for last two, three years, it's been a one API for each year. And as you are bullish on the growth which would be coming in the pharmaceutical segment, so is that you are expecting from the existing products or are you having a new product in the pipeline which you are working and that is going to drive the growth in the pharmaceutical segment. So I'll just an answer this question. Hello? Hello? Yeah. Okay, so uh, see, first is this, uh, our uh, DMR filing has been more than uh, one per year. If you see the average, it has been two to three per year. And that is the philosophy where Heikel works on, that we'll file less number of DMFs. But we will ensure that the DMS are commercialized and we have a good cost process. Now, the, on the cost, uh, on the future growth, it will be a mix of uh, uh, getting more customers for existing products and increasing market share, as well as uh, getting into uh, commercializing these new DMS. As you know that what DMS we file today, it's actually a three to four year process to really commercialize, so it takes some while. So from a current level of two to three DMS, we will actually now uh, will accelerate growth uh, to four to five DMS per year, and, and that's the reason we are investing uh, more in R&D in the last uh, one to two years, and we'll continue to do that. And uh, as I mentioned, that uh, it will always be a combination of old plus new. Okay. And so second question is on the CDMO pipeline. So I think if we look at the sales breakup in the pharmaceutical segment, so if it's something from FI20 to FI22, it has gone significantly down from 50, 54% of the sales to 44% of the sales. So can you provide the, is that due to uh, the, some projects has been dropped off from the pipeline or uh, how, how this pipeline looks like uh, in the coming two, three years? Means are we adding some late stage projects or how this pipeline is going to evolve in the uh, coming time? See, the CDMO projects are uh, always dependent on the forecast from customers. And uh, there are years when uh, the customer goes in for inventory correction, which was uh, in the last year, I'll say, that customers wanted inventory correction because they had built up excess inventory during the pandemic. So that corrections are taking place at this point of time. But at least the base business will be back to where it was, uh, I'll say, in the next uh, Q2 onwards. Now, on the new product pipeline, yes, we are, as we mentioned in our opening statement, several new customers are being added as we speak. Uh, many of them are coming for audits and, uh, and discussion with us now since the pandemic is getting better, I'll say. And the on-site visits have restarted, and we are confident of adding several uh, customers going forward. Uh, as we have mentioned uh, previously, that all customers are looking for alternatives beyond China or what we call the China plus one strategy. And that is playing out in the CDN segment, which we are seeing very clearly. We are seeing several new RFPs uh, coming towards us, and our conversion ratios have also increased in the CDM segment. And that is uh, the same logic applies on the animal health segment, where uh, several big pharma companies have animal health businesses and they also want to partner with new companies uh, in India. So overall, I'll say very healthy pipeline of uh, CDMO projects. So the new order inquiry which you mentioned, is it largely uh, the phase one, phase two, phase three molecules or already commercialized where no, uh, they want to just... I'll say phase three and uh, or to be commercialized. Kind. Phase one, phase two uh, come with their own risks. Uh, we have a few of them. But what we are referring or I am discussing now are more in phase three and uh, getting uh, on the way to commercialization now. In fact, two KSNs, what we have signed, that's already a commercial product, and we are uh, doing a scale-up or a validation quantities at this point of time. All right, sir. That's all from my side. Thank you and all the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Pankaj Jain from Mahavir Investments. Please go ahead. 
thank you for the opportunity uh, sir uh, actually just going through our collaborations and uh, hearing out the throughout the call i understand that there are some short term challenges that the company is facing currently but can you please uh, elaborate or throw some light on how do we see the long term prospect shaping up maybe a uh, longer term view and especially with the initiatives which we have taken and also the transformational program which we have undertaken if you can just give us a long term view how the company will be shaping up hello this is the operator so we are not able to hear you uh are you able to hear me now yes sir hello. mr jain we are able to hear we are not able to hear the management one moment mr mehrotra am i audible yeah i can hear but i thought and since it's a more of a company point of view question i should answer that sir uh, we'll reconnect the management line one moment please okay okay so they have been disconnected actually i'm at a different location today i think the uh, uh the transformational program is well on the way we've identified not only had we have we identified several opportunities for taking out cost and bringing in more efficiency but we've actually done identified several strategic initiatives with customers and product pipelines which are actually yielding results as we speak today i mean as you've heard from both the businesses the pipeline has been increasing over the last two quarters substantially and as manoj has alluded to that there are, there are really live products in the pipeline which are phase 2 and phase 3 and some semi commercial as well uh, vimal himself in his crop protection business has several products in the pipeline close to about 6 right now that are on the way uh, that are being evaluated at the proof of concept stage and that will soon go into semi commercial uh, stages so i think overall from a company perspective um, you know we certainly see growth returning these are short to mid term challenges that we feel that are more external and i think the entire environment is being affected like every manufacturing company out there is being affected by the increase in terms of raw material costs as well as utilities to be a little more specific i'll hand it over to vimal and he can take you through some of his thoughts. yeah so uh, in crop production from cdmo customers we are getting lot of inquiries we are getting inquiries from the same customers for additional products new products as well as from new customers also especially from us and japan in our own products we are going to commission our one fungicide plant in at the end of this financial year and there we have one more product which is under development and we have two three more products which are on development which are expected to come in line maybe in next one to two years so we see a good momentum going forward yeah manoj uh, over to you no, i did answer it. on uh, i did answer on the cdmo pipeline and the dms okay. pipeline okay great 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 that was the that was the only question that was the only question and i wish you all the best given the strong background of the company i hope uh, we will be able to crack everything thanks sir thank you thank you all thank you ladies and gentlemen due to time constraint we will take one last question from the line of grenade delia from panchtantra advisors please go ahead good evening everybody uh, good evening anish i hope all of you are well and i hope that uh, this is the last quarter of disappointments i have a couple of questions on financial front can you please give the total debt figure the term loan as well as the working capital yeah so the total debt yeah so the, uh, the total debt uh, as of uh, march uh, 22 was 675 crore uh, which comprised of uh, 273 crore of uh, working capital debt and uh, 402 crore of long term debt so what we can make out in this call is that the pessimism that you are showing for this current year is only because of the raw material cost push you don't see any uh shock or any problem from the sales side you are only concerned about the profitability the top line does not bother you yes i mean primarily it's driven by raw material input costs right because there have been certain circumstances in which products have become unviable 
to sell because in Q4 and as we see in Q1, because of these sharp, sharp increases in raw material costs and supply chain challenges. From a demand perspective, we don't see challenges, but if these raw material situations and supply chain challenges and energy costs come down, then certainly we, we, we definitely see an upside potential. But, you know, to your first statement, certainly I think Q1 as it's shaping up is definitely more challenging than Q4, but Q1 we hope to bottom out at, and then there'll be a stepwise increase as we see at Q2 through Q4 of this financial year. Okay. And the Taroja facility, how much was it contributing to our top line? What has been disclosed by you in the previous uh, uh, documentaries has been about, say, 220 crores. That's almost 10-12% of our total top line. Yeah, that's correct. It's, it's increased slightly. It's about 260-odd crores. Uh, 260 to 280 crores is what it contributes to our top line. So considering you're already expecting a muted quarter, this shutdown should not be impacting you? Yes. Me, impacting us from what, what from what way? In addition to that, I mean that's part of the reason why we have a muted quota. Okay, okay. And lastly, yeah. you know, I've been a shareholder for almost seven years in the company. Prior to this, we uh, you know packed our bags on the back on the back saying that you know we had managed to de-risk ourselves in raw material procurement from China. And other things that Samir had said initially, unfortunately, is not there in the call. I hope he's there next time around. But uh, all of a sudden, we are uh, seeing that there's been no specification, you know, in our raw material changing policy because it's hitting us even harder now. See, we have de-risked our uh, supply chain significantly, but it's not only China supply chain that's affecting, it's also domestic supply chain that's gone up, right? Input costs have gone up substantially. I mean, feedstock itself, it's not available. You've seen solvent prices uh, that have gone up about 40%. Uh, input costs uh, from domestic suppliers themselves have been affected. So even if you were zero reliant on China, you'd still have input costs. I mean, there are a lot of companies that have uh, no reliance or very limited reliance on China. They still have significant input costs, right? Increase. Also, this time the... Sorry, just to add, this time the... Yeah, go ahead. This time the disruption has been more global. It's not only restricted to China. Yeah. Okay. All over because of first uh, the COVID the crisis, the crisis war in China, in China uh, now the European Ukraine war. So it's all over. Okay, and because of the U Ukraine war, do we see any less offtake in Europe, or that stand is normal? No, offtake stand, offtake stand. In fact, uh, uh, there are uh, there are customer for us who, uh, in Ukraine who is actually even buying now. So offtake stands in all uh, all of European market, but it is the input costs which have become unpredictable. Get it. And, so I hope uh, that you're entering into so all our uh, customers contract. have long-term contracts. They have government tenders and all. So it's very difficult for us to really pass through the cost uh, immediately. It takes time. So I hope that you're also like entering into some long-term contracts with your suppliers to mitigate this for future. We do that definitely, but uh, this time, uh, in our opinion, it has been uh, to some extent force measure as well. Okay. Well, then this would be from my side. Thank you for your time and hope that uh, we recover soon and get back to greener pastures. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the last question for today. I would now like to hand the conference over to Mr. Anish Swadi for closing comments. So I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank everybody for joining the call. I hope we have been able to address uh, all, if not most, of your queries. For any further information, kindly get in touch with our strategic growth advisors who are our investor relations advisors. Thank you very much, and stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Heikel Limited, that concludes this conference call. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.